good to see everybody. Even if it's in your cars. Look at us, Evan Church, right here at the church. <laughs> it's so good to be here with you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If we have any guests, you are welcome too. We're so glad you're here. And our contact information is on the back of the program. So check us out. We're going to have some more virtual services before we fully reopen. But today is a special day of togetherness on Easter. So again, welcome. Good morning. I'm Carl Clements, your lay service leader today. We have some special announcements and instructions for this unusual worship service. First, if you have a joy or concern you'd like to share, please use the pen and sheet of paper in your gift bag to write a brief note. Then stick it out your car window and an usher will uh, pick it up and deliver it to Rev Reverend Ruth who will read them during Circle of Life. We'd like to thank all of our volunteers who are helping with the service and maintaining mitigation measures out of an abundance of caution. Our building remains closed today, and we ask that you remain in your cars with your windows mostly rolled up. We appreciate your cooperation, which helps keep us all safe. During our offertory, we invite you to place your offering in the envelope you'll find in your gift bag, and to write your name on it if you wish your donation to be identified. Please place the envelopes, stick out of your car window, and the ushers will pick them up uh, with the offering uh, bowls at the appropriate time. You may also turn in any pledge cards at that time. Uh, additionally, please look at the order of service, your blue sheet, and on the back there are some important announcements. The prelude prepares us for the service. like Ishtar standing at the entrance to the underworld, like Mary approaching the stone rolled away from her beloved's tomb. We gather at this threshold of this locus of search, the search for truth and meaning, and in awe and wonder 
to light our chalice and prepared for discovery and glad surprise. The call to worship today is by Elizabeth M. Strong. Out of the earth rises light, rises life, rises spring. May we join with the miracle that is springtime and enter into life with lightness and joy. Out of the spirit rises faith, rises hope, rises love. May we join with the miracle that is Easter time and enter into life with hope and love. Let us resurrect with spring. Let us resurrect with the spirit and enter into renewed life as we gather into our time of worship together this Easter morning. Before our opening hymn, I would like to say a special word of welcome and thanks to our guest minister and good friend, the Reverend Tim Trussell Smith. If the name is familiar to you, it is because he is married to our very own April Trussell Smith. Tim is ordained in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Lately, he has been serving the Disciples Church here in Tuscaloosa and is now searching for his own new adventure in ministry and we are so pleased that he was available to come and help lead the service today. Welcome Tim. Our opening hymn is Joy Thou Goddess and this is Beethoven's great hymn. So I hope in your cars you sing lustily as we sing Joy Thou Goddess. We start with a joy, well, several joys, from Evan Tidwell. Uh, Evan is getting ready to marry his beloved Paul Thompson this June. We're so excited. Uh, gratitude for the COVID-19 vaccine and all of our health care workers, indeed. And thankfulness for our gathering this morning. And it is very exciting for us all to be here. And then he adds sorrows, the loss of family relationships. 
because he is a member of the LGBTQ community. That is a sadness, to be sure. I'm going to light one candle for all of you. Miss Edie would like to have a candle lit to tell you that we'll be moving and she's so excited. And she would also like to say that they have a new cat and she loves him. He is a gray tabby. Terrific. This person didn't sign this one, so I'm not sure who it is. Chi Chi, Charlie, and I are so happy to see everybody on this beautiful day that nature has given us. April 15th was Linda's birthday. I miss her very much. It's Shanta. Oh, that's Shanta. Shanta. That's Shanta. I see her waving. Okay. I'm going to light another candle in uh, connection, just a candle of connection to all of our good friends who were not able to be with us here today in person. They might tune in to listen and see this, listen to and see the service later uh, because we are recording. So we're thinking of all of them. Let's take a moment of silence together and I'll close this with a few words. The forces of life are all around us. Life is bubbling up under our feet. It is raining down from the heavens. It is blooming and bursting and burgeoning all around us. There is surely still sorrow and loss and challenge ahead. But it is a good, good day to celebrate the gift of rebirth, renewal, resurrection, the gift of life. Amen, shalom, blessed be. And I'm going to light a final candle for all of those things that went unspoken today. Now we'll have our story for all ages. And I know we have some young people here. And we, all of us, were young people once. And some of us might be trying it out again. Once upon a time, there was a wonderful little congregation in Alabama. And because a terrible sickness came through the land, the wonderful people in this wonderful congregation could not gather together for a very long time. And they did not get to do some of the things that they really liked to do together, things that nourished their hearts and their minds and their spirits. And sometimes they felt very sad about it. And they realized as Easter approached for the second time that because the sickness hadn't quite all gone away, they would not be able to gather together inside their building 
and bring flowers to share with each other in what we call the flower communion. And that did feel very sad because that was a precious thing. They would bring flowers from their own gardens and put them all together and then they would all take a different flower home and it reminded them of how connected they were. And for the second year in a row, they weren't able to do that. But someone said, I know what we'll do. Let's give everybody some flower seeds. Let's put them in a gift bag along with other good stuff. And let's send them home and say, plant these seeds. These seeds will grow into flowers and these flowers will connect us. And they will remind us that the illness will not last forever. And we will share flowers again. Go home and grow your seeds and remember, life is still life and we are still here. And there is still much to be thankful for. Amen. We don't have music for this children's hymn, but we've sung it before. So I'm going to sing it, and you sing with me in your cars. Touch the earth, reach the sky. Children ask the reason why in our lives the answer show and grow they learn and take the morning offering. Out of gratitude for all that we have been given and all that we have now, we share our resources because we love and trust each other and because this church enriches our lives and empowers us to make our world a better place. We rely upon each other, members and friends, and we appreciate the payment of pledges and generous donations to support the legacy, vision, and work of this church community. As you know, uh, all checks, undesignated checks and cash will be uh, split with our partners for this quarter. of our hands and the generosity of our hearts, our love is made real. Thank you for these gifts. A reading from 
Howard Thurman. Resurrection, the glad surprise. There is ever something compelling and exhilarating about the glad surprise. The emphasis is upon glad. There are surprises that are shocking, startling, frightening, bewildering. But the glad surprise is something different from all of these. It carries with it the element of elation, of life, of something over and beyond the surprise itself. The manifestation of this quality in the world about us can best be witnessed in the coming of spring. It is ever a new thing, a glad surprise the stirring of life at the end of winter. One day there seems to be no sign of life, and then almost overnight, swelling buds, delicate blooms, blades of grass, bugs, insects, an entire world of newness everywhere. It is the glad surprise at the end of winter. Often the same experience comes at the end of a long tunnel of tragedy and tribulation. It is as if someone stumbling in the darkness, having lost their way, finds that the spot at which they fall is the foot of a stairway that leads from darkness into light. This, such is the glad surprise. This is what Easter means in the experience of the human family. This is the resurrection. It is the announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death, that there is no road that is at last swallowed up in an ultimate darkness, that there is strength added when the labors increase, that multiplied peace matches multiplied trials, that life is bottomed by the glad surprise. Take courage, therefore, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, the divine's full giving is only begun. The words of Howard Thurman. Tim, I'd like to tell you a story about an Easter morning a long time ago when I was a young Methodist minister. I stood in the church cemetery with a handful of stalwart early risers to watch the sun rise over the hill and remember and celebrate the story in the Christian Bible of the discovery by his disciples that Jesus' tomb was empty. We were there in the damp spring morning seeking assurance that despite all evidence to the contrary, death is not the end of our existence but a doorway to a new life. But all I could think was, Molly is dead. My friend of 17 years had died suddenly at age 31 just a few days before and in my heart and head, I was still standing next to her coffin and in another cemetery surrounded by weeping mourners. In that moment of Easter sunrise, I did not feel like a leader guiding my parishioners to a place of spiritual celebration on the highest holy day of the Christian year. I felt like the disciple Mary journeying as dawn approached to the grave of her beloved rabbi to serve him one last time by anointing his corpse for proper burial. I could not see the light. I could not 
Perceived the rock rolled away yet, I could not see my way to the empty tomb. I was still struggling in the dark, grieving my friend, my faith shaken, my heart broken. What did Easter have for me? Well, Ruth, on that first Easter morning, the disciple we call Mary Magdalene, or my beloved English professor in college would call Mary Magdalene, was in that same place you were. A cemetery, mourning a friend, taking from them too soon. She came to the tomb that morning either by herself, according to the Gospel of John, or with other women, according to Matthew and Luke. But the sunrise didn't hold hope for them, just duty, just love expressed at the end of a life. They brought oil and spices to bathe Jesus' body, a final act of love. It was another repetition of an endless cycle, death in the midst of life. And as you know, the place they came to was a garden tomb outside Jerusalem, which meant this was a small cave, either natural or human-made, with niches in which to lay dead bodies, usually several, it would be for a family. And some sort of large stone could be rolled in front of the door to the cave. And the women came to Jesus' tomb that morning, not expecting resurrection not hoping for anything. They came wondering even, according to the story, who will roll away the stone for us? But they came anyway, led by love and grief. And these women, not the male disciples who were hiding out around Jerusalem, came wondering how they would move that stone, that heavy stone that affirmed death, the stone that seemed almost as heavy as the grief which lay like a boulder in their guts. And my scriptures say they were met by a mysterious figure, robed in white, who in one version of the tale asks them the poetic question, why do you seek the living among the dead? Excuse me. And in another version, tells them, he is not here. In Mark's gospel, the earliest gospel, they just run away, too frightened to tell anyone what they've seen. Of course, it's clear they did tell people what they saw, as the other gospels say that they did. They go to proclaim this good news. And so I find myself here a Christian minister telling the story of my faith, which centers on this miracle of resurrection. But, like many Christians, I'm skeptical about the resurrection. What does it really mean? Many of us find ourselves in this place of uncertainty. And Howard Thurman, claimed by both Christians and Unitarians, because he was a Baptist minister who also founded the first inter-religious community in the United States, intentionally inter-religious, he writes in the reading I share today that resurrection is the announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death, that life is bottomed by the glad surprise. And Christian mystics like Thurman help us embrace the wider implications of resurrection. And I think these implications can then speak to all people. Even if the women didn't really find Jesus' tomb empty on Easter, their presence there that morning, discovering mutual love and care for this lost friend, would be a glad surprise in and of itself, an announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death.
can you tell such a powerful story? And yes, it's hard for many of us to understand or find value in it. Frankly, in the 21st century, it's difficult to take it seriously. Easter is tricky. We, you use our respecters of science. And the science of life and death is pretty clear and long tested. Dead is dead. We are mortal creatures and our life begins with the life force within the gametes from our biological parents, which combine to make a living and zygote. Just bringing back high school biology for anybody. <laughs> Under the right conditions, it grows into a human being that is born and begins an independent living existence. Life comes from life. Life does not come from death. Many of us are more comfortable on Easter with bunnies and eggs and the stories from the fertility cults of Northern Europe. According to the Encyclopedia Mythica, in ancient Anglo-Saxon myth, Ostara, also known as Eastri, is the personification of the rising sun. In that capacity, she is associated with spring and is considered to be a fertility goddess. She is the friend of all children, and to amuse them, she changed her pet bird into a rabbit. This rabbit brought forth brightly colored eggs which the goddess gave to the children as gifts. From her name and rites, the festival of Easter is derived. Moreover, the theme of resurrection from the dead is hardly original with the stories in the Christian gospels. There are several much older tales with striking similarities. According to Dr. Tony Nugent, teacher of theology and religious studies at Seattle University, the Easter story has roots in the Sumerian legend of Tammuz and his wife Ishtar, in an epic myth found inscribed on cuneiform clay tablets dating back over 4,000 years. The legend goes that when Tammuz died, Ishtar was grief-stricken and followed him to the underworld where she was violently killed. In her absence, the earth lost its fertility crops cease unless something was done all life on earth would end after ishtar had been missing for three days the god enki sent two creatures who carried the water of life down to the underworld and sprinkled it on ishtar and tammuz resurrected they returned to the earth as the light of the sun and brought back spring and summer after six months, Tammuz returned to the underworld, and Ishtar pursued him again, while her absence brought about winter, and the cycle of seasons was created. Dr. Nugent points out that the story of Ishtar and Tammuz is just one of a number of accounts of dying and rising gods that represent the cycles of the seasons and the stars. There's the resurrection of the Egyptian god Horus, the story of Mithras, who was worshipped at springtime, and the tale of Dionysus, resurrected by his grandmother. Among these stories are prevailing themes of fertility, conception, renewal, descent into darkness, and the triumph of light over darkness, or good over evil. What about the rabbit and the eggs? The spring goddess was associated with the hare, which was a symbol of fertility and abundance, and eggs have long been symbols of renewal across cultures for centuries for their round, endless shape filled with the promise of life. Because Easter is tied to the vernal equinox, the first day of spring, it is also associated with a pre-enlightenment understanding of the Earth's position in the solar system and its relationship to the sun. Ancient peoples observed that the sun's position in the sky and the length of daylight changed constantly and progressed in one seasonal direction for six months and then reversed progression in the opposite direction for the other six months. Celebrating the days of those reversals 
was an important part of many early cultures, as was noting the two days of the year when light and dark are in balance, the spring and fall equinoxes. What we understand in the northern hemisphere temperate zones is that the seasons follow a predictable cycle based on the Earth's revolution around the sun while it spins on its axis. Ancient humans wove stories from their observations and experiences of the natural world to explain what was beyond observation. Why? As they wondered and marveled at the changes of light and temperature and the movement of wind and water, they created myths to answer the as yet unanswerable questions. Consider that a basic understanding of the plant life cycle can be derived from close observation of plants. Put a seed in the dirt where the sun will shine on it, add water, wait. The seed sprouts, the plant grows, blossoms, produces seeds, withers, and dies. And all that is necessary to resurrect that plant is plant one of its seeds under similar conditions. Over and over, it can be done. Here is basic scientific method, theory, experimentation, confirmation, conclusion. Here is resurrection, very reliable scientific resurrection. Well, almost. Gregor Mendel started working with his peas, and we discovered that a new sprout is not an exact replica of the dead plant. It's not a true resurrection, is it? And we know we can't do this with animals or people. We may wish we could plant a withered human body in the ground and wait for it to come back to life, but bodies in the ground decompose. They do not come back to life except in the movies. And even then, it's not a pretty picture. We could talk about genetic manipulation, cloning, cryogenics, but none of it is real, true, exact scientific resurrection from the dead. It is not death back to life. But a long time ago, at the edge of rudimentary science, ancient peoples faced the fearful mystery of mortality and asked the reasonable question, if some living things apparently resurrect, why not people? Entangled in the question were the great hopes and needs of the human heart, the family, the community. And they needed to believe that there was an answer, even more, a solution to the problem of death. They needed to find hope to keep living meaningfully while carrying the knowledge of human finitude. They needed a way to affirm the power of life amidst the reality of death, to assert that our own living and our connection to all living things is stronger than our fears and our pain. Under that connection of all life to all other living things and the resurrection that we see in springtime, it reminds me of a morning in Boston. April and I lived in Boston. We both did graduate work up there. I was in seminary. And we're both from Georgia. And April, I remember telling one of her Unitarian ministers, I never understood Easter until I moved to Boston because you actually have winter and spring coming out suddenly. Actual resurrection, not just some kind of frigid thing in the middle. But the story I'm thinking of is one that happened to me on an early morning. It wasn't an Easter morning, but it was a, a Boston, chill Boston morning in the fall. And for many weeks, I had come into the yard behind our basement apartment just before dawn to simply sit in the grass and breathe. And I wasn't looking for resurrection in those mornings. I was just looking for peace, just healing of some sort in the midst of a hard time in my life. 
I breathe and feel the light on my skin and sense the life flowing around me. And sometimes, more and more often by that point I had found, such things would restore me. But that morning, in particular, there was some sort of desperate sadness that seemed to sit right in the middle of my chest, and it wouldn't go away. I couldn't even focus on my breathing. And I began to feel anxiety building within me. I felt, frankly, like I was going to die, and it was too much. I needed to know that the sun was still shining, so I opened my eyes. And when they opened, there was a cat. As a cat had stopped at the base of the chain link fence at the back of the yard. And this cat's face was turned towards me. And when I opened my eyes, it was looking right in my eyes. I don't remember thinking anything. I was completely surprised. So I just looked back at this cat. We looked into each other's eyes for several seconds, just seeing each other. And then the cat turned its head and continued to prowl along the base of the fence. And I suddenly noticed, with a great shock, that the ball of fear and sadness in my chest wasn't there anymore. All my worries, all my fears, all my angst for a moment were gone, and all that was left was me, surrounded by leaf-dappled sunlight and grass. What gift had that living creature, so like me yet so different, given to me without having any interest in giving me anything? I felt resurrected in that moment. I felt set free. Surprising resurrection found in the eyes of my fellow creature. And in the years since I've thought about this moment a lot, I think the power of the cat's look was that there was no pretense, no motivation, there was simply the confirmation, yes, you exist. Yes, you are there. I see you. And that's the affirmation of Easter, too, that odd and impossible to explain mystical salvation that Christians like me believe in, is that life is there, even when it feels like it isn't. The affirmation that God is love and we can break it down even more simply that love is life affirming itself against all the powers of darkness. It was the glad surprise that Thurman speaks of. That encounter with a stray cat became the ladder I found just where I'd fallen that led back into light. The cat had things to get on with. And so did I. Life goes on despite everything. And the women on Easter morning affirm that life still has power in the face of death. Just by showing up, they affirmed life's power in the midst of death. Just like we're showing up this morning in the midst of half a million and more deaths that have brought our world to a stop. Here we are. Here we are. That stray cat affirmed my real presence in the world. By living, I existed in the moment and no amount of fear or anxiety could alter that essential fact of my being alive. And no fear or anxiety or real threat can alter the fact of your existence as a community of love and justice. You are here, I see you. We're here together on Easter. Amen. Now you can have your answer. Oh, Lord, have mercy. There we go. Absolutely right, Tim. The power of life is in the beingness of who we are right now and who we may become in our
our living experience. We are certainly mortal creatures, and as far as we know, we are the only beings in the universe who understand this reality about our own existence. The living person I am began with two microscopic sparks of life, and the life force which permeates every cell of my being will one day dissipate into the ether and my body will die. What happens to the me which inhabits that body? We don't know. But human beings lean in to the stories about life's power in the midst of death, of life beyond death, of the life force which continues somehow after the spark leaves the flesh. The ancient Hebrew text of the Song of Solomon declares that love is as strong as death and passion is as fierce as the grave. While springtime gives us a boost every year after the cold of winter, the Easter story pushes us to face the ultimate mystery yet again, to ask the deeper questions about the meaning of our individual lives, our passionate connections to one another, and the future of our collective existence on the earth. Easter is not an answer, but a signpost along the ongoing journey of the search for truth and meaning, a reminder to us pilgrims to claim and celebrate the glad surprise of being alive. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be. Our closing hymn is, Lo, the day of days is here. Sing lustily in your cars.
seeds we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I appear to be missing part of my benediction. It seems to have blown away. A Christian like me would say the spirit moved, and I'm supposed to say something different. So I'll give you part of Alex Holt's benediction, and then my own. No, I'll just do my own, because Alex's part doesn't make sense. My apologies. But let me bless you, my friends. Let me give you an Easter blessing fitting for both my tradition and all the traditions that are celebrated here. And I also share in the UU tradition. I have served UU congregations and consider myself a UU in some measure. So let's all be blessed together. Let us celebrate the return of life to the earth. Let us celebrate the lengthening of days that show us the year moves on. Let us know that the past has happened. Pain has been, death is real, but life goes on. May these things be true for you. May you move forward with joy and hope and love and faith in the power of life. Blessed be. to thank you for joining us, and thanks to Reverend Ruth and Reverend Tim for your messages today. Please stay in your heart and your heart uh, as you will. Thank you.